Hi hey, gang, back in the office this week um, and we're going to be looking at having respect for everybody this week. So we had a brilliant assembly from Mr Richards about Jesus and Matthew the tax collector. So we're going to follow on with that, looking at how we have respect for everybody and a particular type of Christianity called liberation theology and how that can inform us in our faith and how we treat other people. Let's have a look now. So Jesus's life and ministry as depicted in the Bible is full of examples of how we have respect for everyone he met, regardless of who they were or what others might think of them. And his relationship with Matthew that Mr. Richards told us about last time is perhaps one of the best of those examples. The fact that Jesus chose a tax collector, someone who the rest of his society hated as one of his disciples, is part of the reason why Jesus' message was so unique and popular and remains so to this day. Jesus surrounded himself then with people that society declared were not good enough. Tax collectors like Matthew, lepers, sinners, peasants, disgraced men and women, thieves and zealots. And he taught that God loved them all. That God loves everyone no matter what their job or background or beliefs from the super rich and fortunate who had everything they needed and more, to the poor and outcast who, because of their social status or health or, or just bad luck, barely have enough to survive. And because God loves everyone, God doesn't want to see any of us suffer needlessly. And so when those people who have lots refuse to share with those who don't have enough, well that is definitely not the will of God. To be a follower of Christ then means that we have love and respect for all and that means helping all those in need and working together for a society that cares for everybody. In fact, in the book of Acts, which is one of the books of the Bible, we hear about the very first Christians, those followers of Christ who actually knew him and then after his death and resurrection come together to form the first Christian communities. And the very first thing they do as part of those Christian communities is decide that the wealthiest amongst them should sell some of what they have and give the money to the poorest so that everybody is on equal footing in love and respect with one another. The belief that God loves all of us equally and wants no one to go without is the foundation of a movement known as liberation theology. Now that's a couple of big words. Theology just means thinking about God. So uh, Theo, God, ology, thinking about. Uh, and I know you're all brilliant at that. And liberation means to set free. So liberation theology means thinking about God from the point of view of those people on the margins, people who don't feel free, but instead feel trapped or hemmed in by the judgment and disrespect of others. Liberation theology then starts not with the rich and powerful and famous, but with the poor and dispossessed and, well, just ordinary people. Which is very different from how we often think about things, isn't it? The classic approach is known as top-down. That means from the point of view of the rich and powerful. So in history, for instance, we learn loads about kings and queens, nobles and bishops, but very little about ordinary people about the way they live their lives or what's important to them, that it's largely forgotten. And Christian theology is also guilty of this and has been in the past. It's led to all sorts of awful things like when the church was part of the transatlantic slave trade. And that was because it took a top-down approach wherein it believed that the wealth of a small number of powerful white people was much more important than the very lives of millions of poor black people. Liberation theology turns all this on its head in what's known as a bottom-up approach. It starts with the people of God, what they believe and feel, their hopes and dreams, their lives and their legacies and their faith, and it works outwards and upwards from there. There are loads of different branches of liberation theology seeking to think about God from the point of view of, of poor Christians, black Christians, female Christians, Asian Christians, disabled Christians, LGBT plus Christians. And in fact, an early form of this type of theology was the driving movement behind the Beveridge Report and the birth of the NHS and the welfare state which keeps us all safe today. Some of you might remember Months ago now, we talked about William Temple, Archbishop William Temple, 
And this was this was the kind of faith that he had, which led to the welfare state that we have now. And what all liberation theologies have in common is their total commitment to and love and respect for each and every one of God's children. Now, one of the most famous liberation theologians is one of my personal heroes. He's a man called Oscar Romero, and we're going to watch a short video about his life now. In the 1970s was a country deeply divided. Most Salvadorans lived in extreme poverty, while a small number of rich families controlled most of the wealth and political power. Violence was regularly used against those who stood up to challenge this inequality. This was the situation when Oscar Romero became Archbishop of San Salvador, the nation's capital, in 1977. Originally, he was seen as a safe pair of hands, someone who would not rock the boat. But as Archbishop, he would regularly hear first-hand accounts of the ordinary working people who would be threatened or disappear without trace. Romero said, The word of God is like the light of the sun. It illuminates beautiful things, but also things which we would rather not see. Weeks after he had become Archbishop, his close friend, the Jesuit father Rotilio Grande, was killed. It was then that Archbishop Romero began to speak out. If they have killed him for doing what he did, then I too have to walk the same path. Each week, after many hours of research, consultation and prayer, Romero used his lengthy Sunday homilies as a platform. He condemned the repression and would name an account for every man, woman and child who had been targeted and killed or disappeared. He used his sermons to challenge those in power. It is not God's will for some to have everything and others to have nothing. In a time of heavy press censorship, his sermons broadcast nationwide over the radio were the only way that people could hear the truth about the atrocities happening in their country. It was a dangerous path. Receiving death threats, Romero knew that one day soon he could be killed. Still, he remained utterly committed to carrying out his mission. Days before his assassination, he said, As a Christian, I do not believe in death without resurrection. If they kill me, I will rise again in the people of El Salvador. A bishop may die, but the Church of God, which is the people, will never die. On the eve of his assassination, he urged soldiers and police not to follow orders to kill. The peasants you kill are your own brothers and sisters. When a man tells you to kill, remember God's words, thou shalt not kill. In the name of God and in the name of this suffering people, I beg you, I beseech you, I order you in the name of God, stop the repression. At 6.26 p.m. on 24th of March 1980, while celebrating mass, Archbishop Romero was shot dead at the altar in the chapel of the cancer hospital where he lived. Oscar Romero gave his life to speak out on behalf of the poor and oppressed in his country. Romero's example remains an inspiration to millions across the globe who work for justice, reconciliation and peace. So you see how Oscar Romero believed that all people should be treated with love and respect regardless of what anyone else might think of them, because we are all children of God. He even gave his life in defence of this belief. Now thankfully, most of us are not called to be as courageous as Oscar Romero, but we are called to love like he did, to treat each and every person with the utmost respect and dignity and love 
because each and every person is a child of God. So let's end with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God bless everyone. for brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in the suffering, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cure for their ills. Work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills. Land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak. Voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor. Of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, the tears fall like rain. Come change our love from a spark to a flame. Refuge from cruel wars. Havens from fear, cities for sanctuary, freedoms to share. Peace to the killing fields, scorched earth to green. Christ for the bitterness, his cross for the pain. God of the poor. Until the nation